Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Amongst the uh, news items we have for you this week, results of the uh, Seralini lawsuit for defamation against a uh, significant development in uh, models of Alzheimer's disease with the ability to transfer the disease to young healthy animals that are otherwise not infected or subject to the disease. Uh, fungal infections uh, could be a, a contributing factor to Alzheimer's disease. Human consciousness might be a result of entropy, or at least uh, physicists are certainly making the claim. Food sensitivity testing using immunoglobulin G, IgG, or immunoglobulin gamma may not be as valid as you think. China has uh, supposedly achieved a variant of rice that can grow in cell in soil, ideally making it possible to grow rice where you otherwise can't. And finally, a unusual form of ice has been found, but it only melts at extreme temperatures. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. First we have more drama and controversy from the researcher Seralini. This is a French researcher who previously tried to argue that glyphosate causes all sorts of issues in mice, or rats more accurately, particularly that it causes cancer. The issue is that the Spragdoli rats that were used in his research will always develop cancer. And the longer they live, the more likely that is to happen. When this bastard decided to euthanize those rats at the end of two years, just about every single one had tumors that were not only inhumane, but completely pointless. The research and the ethics of it were no less than controversial, and certainly far harsher language should be used. That same researcher now tried to uh, sue scientists for defamation, when they were claiming that his work and some of his other results and similar were basically bullshit. Something that is entirely true, but necessarily didn't think so. So in order to make his point, he decided to sue three journalists who had published on his work, calling it out for what it is. Mostly that they had called what he did fraudulent, and unfortunately for Seralini, the courts had sided with them, saying in no uncertain terms that your case has no merit, with it now being thrown out, or more accurately, dismissed. While the results of this case aren't as entertaining as when anti-vaxxers fund research that goes against their claims, the nature of it is important, partly because what he was trying to do would stifle reporting on science, and while in some cases there is unfounded optimism about results, in other cases, it can be used to uh, spread misinformation, largely related to exaggerated results being attributed with more value or realistic expectations than they warrant. In this case, however, uh, talking about the research and very clearly highlighting what is wrong with it, how, why, and when, is perfectly reasonable. It's an accurate report in most cases, and as a result, Suing them for defamation is like saying that you're going to sue someone for describing the sky as blue. It just doesn't work. Even the court recognizes this when they said that the report relied on abundant factual bases, which justifies using the semantics, which should not be understood in the strict sense of scientific fraud, but rather as criticism of acts contravening the ethics that should surround the production and media coverage of scientific work. Yeah. In other words, what they said was accurate, and you can't try and twist the language to present it as something more other than what it is. There is a great deal more detail in the blog post, let's say, for the Alliance for Science, and you can read on not only some of the background, but a lot of the, let's say, opinions from other researchers as to how ridiculous this entire matter was. Shifting from, well, research that is baseless to research that at least has a much stronger basis, and that is how a working night shift can be particularly bad for your body. Now, it might sound odd to say this, but those who work night shift generally have a much higher rate of things like being obese, developing diabetes, cancer, depression, and all sorts of other health-related issues. And why exactly working at night does this hasn't been well established. And it's not just necessarily working at night, 
it's literally any kind of shift work where you have a rotating roster of days and nights. Somehow, that alteration leads to uh, health issues. Now we have a, a slightly better idea as to what's going on, but, well, the research is uh, flawed in several ways in terms of actually being able to be translated, and in some ways it's very similar to the Seralini affair. It's based on a rodent model. Because it's based on a rodent model, it may not translate to a human situation in any way, shape, or form. But it's certainly far more information than just relying on the vicarious measure of knowing that people work night shift and the incidence of disease. We simply don't have a mechanism based on that. The next issue is that, well, the methodology is not exactly perfect. Rather than stimulating or simulating a uh, irregular cycle, Instead, the researchers chose to uh, give the rodents an infusion of corticosteroid, a steroid, basically cortisol. And this would either be aligned with a light-dark cycle, so day-night, or not aligned with it. And because of this, they could then look at what happened with both the amount of food consumed and uh, various changes in the genome. What they found in particular was kind of interesting, but also weird, and weird in good ways. First, the alteration didn't necessarily lead to any weight gain, but it did drastically alter the feeding patterns. Because the rodents themselves were eating at irregular times by comparison to the control group, they then noticed that there was a change in the expression of certain genes. These genes are all related to proteins that stimulate the appetite, and because they were active when they're normally not active, this then led to alterations in how the body dealt with the food that was coming in and the associated energy and other nutrition. This then led to some bizarre carry-on effects and you can see that there's a, a series of dominoes lining up to lead to unexpected consequences. The final issue with this is uh, far more direct and uh, certainly more difficult to overcome. That is, no matter what you do, there is a certain biological impulse for certain things. The big one here is going to be something like hunger. No matter how much you uh, discipline someone, no matter how structured their environment is, the desire to eat will be the desire to eat. It's why zombies are such a pain to deal with in all the fiction settings. They want brains, and they'll do anything to get them. Humans are at least slightly better in that they will have some limitations put on them, unless they're stuck in the Andes and are soccer players. In news that's slightly more promising, and promising in that it's actually useful, researchers have been able to uh, transfer Alzheimer's disease from sick, infected animals, or more accurately, diseased animals, into young animals that are healthy. Now, this sounds weird, but there is a good reason why being able to do this is important. When you look at Alzheimer's disease, it's nearly always detected only once symptoms have started showing, and by the time symptoms are showing, it is well and truly developed. You are well on your way to being sick, and there's no way back from it. If you can start the model of disease in an established state in an early state of the animal's lifetime, you're able to understand what's going on. The importance of this is huge. It means you can look at possible changes in the brain of the animal before symptoms start to show. You know the animal has it, and you don't need to kill the animal, take out their brain, and investigate to see if that's true. You can rely solely on the definitive idea that you have a model that works. Even better again, you don't actually have to start invading the rodents or other animals' brain to do this. You actually just need to transplant microbes from the GI tract of one animal into another. This also somewhat definitively demonstrates that there is a relationship and a causal relationship between the GI tract microbiome and Alzheimer's disease. In some respects, this also provides a target for treatment that might arguably be able to slow down progress of Alzheimer's disease and in the very, very, very long term, be able to provide a possible way of stopping Alzheimer's disease before it ever really becomes an issue. However, that is entirely hypothetical and in the very distant future. Luckily, about the same time we have flying cars. Understand that this research is not only preliminary, but it is based entirely on an animal model. And so there are all sorts of concerns about how well it will translate to humans,
whether or not we can actually take advantage of it and other barriers to implementing this. But if the causal relationship is as clear as it might seem at first glance, there is a very big target for therapeutic interventions that could drastically improve outcomes for those who have Alzheimer's disease and preventing the progress of Alzheimer's disease. In further news relating to Alzheimer's disease, though, we also have um, possible relationships to fungal infections. And weirdly enough that uh, possibly the fungal infection could be causing Alzheimer's disease or at least something very much like it. The issue here is that the fungi can, if it continues to grow, lead to the development of the amyloid plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. The fungi is a relatively common one, Candida albicans. And unfortunately, this is the same Candida albicans, or yeast infection, that is responsible for things like thrush. Yeah. So we're not talking about a rare tropical disease here or anything exciting. It is a relatively mundane and common fungi. Well, common in that it occurs regularly in at least half the population, if not more. The strange thing is that it's not just Alzheimer's disease that this is associated with, and in fact autopsies of people's brains with Alzheimer's disease have also been commonalities with Parkinson's disease and other neurological diseases. So this isn't just a one-off relationship. It appears that somehow or other the Candida albicans, or yeast, has a very common relationship with a number of neurological diseases and could in theory be contributing to its spread, if not the impact. But of course, this is taking the research several steps beyond what was found. At the moment, all they have is a correlation. That is, there are so many cases of this, and they've been found in these brains with these diseases, therefore possibly. Of course, this then does lead to studies, and studies using mice that are infected with the yeast have indeed shown the same sort of neurological issues, and treating the fungus and thereby removing it did at least show improvement in the cognitive function, but improvements aren't resolving it. It's just that you're not as good as you were, but you're certainly not going to get worse. The underlying mechanism is all the more interesting because that's what the researchers were able to get a better understanding of. First, they were able to figure out that if the fungus gets into the brain somehow, it begins to uh, trigger various immune responses. Now, some of these are fairly typical. You're going to find that there are immune cells trying to get rid of the fungus, but also that the blood-brain barrier becomes more porous. More porosity means that if there is a fungus in the bloodstream, for instance, it can now get into the brain because the blood-brain barrier is extra leaky. Because of this, you now have problems, because even if the immune cells in the brain can begin cleaning up what is there already, once you start introducing more, they're going to have more and more of a challenge. And of course, with greater challenge and immunological activity, you get inflammation. Inflammation, along with the other activity in the brain, is associated with development of not only the amyloid plaques that are a problem, but Alzheimer's disease is a general rule. Shifting to other neurological conditions and diseases, we have bizarre changes in the brain during menstruation. And yeah, this is actually further evidence that there is, at least during the monthly menstrual cycle, significant changes in the hormones, which isn't that surprising for anybody. But what is important here is the change on the brain, and particularly actual physiological and neurological changes. Unlike most common understandings, the hormones release themselves, although they will affect the emotions and behaviours to an extent, normally wouldn't change the way the brain works, but here we're seeing just that. Details that there are actual structural changes that take place in the brain during the month that well, menstruation occurs, so every 28 days, or give or take a little bit. Unlike the previous study, which is certainly building on a lot more groundwork, this is not just relatively new, but more importantly, it's on a preprint server. So we can look at it, and we can understand it, and read it and go, awesome. But we can't actually sit there and say that this research has been peer-reviewed.
So for all anybody could say at the moment, in fact this research is a fraudulent like Seralini, except it's doubtful these researchers would try and sue someone for libel or slander. As a general rule, the changes you would expect to see in the female population during menstruation, or at least the menstrual cycle, follow a particular series of organs or parts of the body. That's the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the gonade roots. This is otherwise known as the HPG axes. This is because each of them is involved in not only production of hormones, but is then in turn regulated by these same hormones and hormones it triggers from other parts of the axes. The MRI scans that were used along with the time points in question give a better understanding about what's going on, although again remembering that this is relatively early in the publication's lifespan and it has not undergone a peer review, so methods, results and so on should be taken with a considerably greater level of salt than usual. They did measure the menstrual phase, the menses phase and the ovulation phase. What is important here is that during the uh, ovulatory phase, there was a significant change in the amount of white matter. This meant that there would be more, in, or at least improved, uh, communication between neurons. During the same time frame, the uh, follicle stimulating hormone caused a uh, change in the amount of white matter, particularly that it thickened it. And then the progesterone release during this caused an increase in the uh, tissues but decreased the cerebrospinal fluid. This is bizarre, not just because, well, the nature of the brain is always in flux, but the human brain is incredibly complicated and hard to understand at the best of times. And now we need to consider that at a minimum, there are three time points in which the human brain is going to vary considerably or at least it will be between the periods of prepubescence and postmenopause, which is a significant time frame. Continuing to uh, look into the human mind and the weird ways it behaves when we want to do something with it, and particularly treatments, understanding why it is that antidepressants often take several weeks to begin to take effect, and it's not just that it takes time for the drugs to clear out of the brain. As a general rule, antidepressants aren't expected to begin to show results for at least two weeks after you begin taking them. Part of this is due to the half-life of the drug. That is, by the time you get to a therapeutic dose, it takes at least two weeks. And this is because the medication gets removed from the body at a relatively constant rate. This rate of removal means that you need to then take another dose to get up to that same level. But then the dose is slightly above what you need and it begins to clear out of the body. And you repeat this process again and again until you get to a plateau where it equals out. This period when it begins to reach a relatively static level of the clearance rate being equal to the rate at which you are taking it is basically the two week period although it can take longer depending on the individual, the drug and a few other factors but for the most part we can assume at least two weeks. And so looking at one of the most common kinds of drugs used this being SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, we now have a better understanding of what's going on, and far better than the previous studies that have tried to claim that SSRIs don't work. And that's not what that study was looking at, and at some point we must make a video debunking the misunderstandings on it. What the researchers have found in this study is both kind of awesome, but also you need to be very cautious in how much weight you attribute to it. First, it's a first-of-kind study. This is the first reason why you need to be skeptical. What they did was measure the physical changes in how connected the neurons are after an individual started taking the medication, the SSRIs. Importantly, they were measuring the connections for the synapses. Over time, those who were consuming SSRIs had an increase, and to be very clear, it is a gradual increase in the connectivity of synapses in both the neocortex and the hippocampus. And these are both important parts of the brain, largely related to emotion, which would explain why they work the way they do. Now for the reasons why you should be skeptical. First, this was a double-blinded study with 32 participants. This meant that 16 of them, if there was an equal grouping, did not get the medication. 
was double blinded and semi randomized, so everything so far is great. That's the gold standard. Double blinded, semi randomized is not ideal, but it is what it is. The participants were given a relatively low dose of the medication, about 20 milligrams, and they took this for five weeks. Now, everybody who was involved in the study had a history of depression, so they have targeted individuals who this should work on. They then stuck them in a PET scanning system and analyzed their brain to see what was going on. They found, by a vicarious measurement of a particular kind of vesicle, that there was a greater degree of synapse activity and density in certain areas, these being the areas we've mentioned. The research is kind of important for two reasons. The first is that if what they have found, and there's a very big if there, is extrapolated out to the rest of the population, we now have a, a new way of targeting the brain for antidepressants that may just be a development of the SSRIs currently in use, or it could be a completely novel approach that uses a different drug to achieve the same outcome. The other is that it may also explain, to a degree, why, despite treatment, some people are simply resistant to any antidepressant and they remain depressed, although this doesn't necessarily apply to robots. I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed. Well, we have something that should take your mind off things. It won't work. I have an exceptionally large mind. Yeah. Moving from, let's say, uh, the idea of uh, giving you hope and making you happy to uh, physics research that would probably make you question yourself and have a, a momentary crisis. The idea that your entire person, and in those terms we're talking about your mind, your personality, and everything else, is just a byproduct of entropy, the slow but certain heat decay of the universe. Yeah. To uh, no one's surprise, a combination of French and Canadian researchers have been uh, trying to figure out whether or not a model they've developed really does show that a consciousness is just a product of the chaos of the universe, and so between the University of Toronto and the Paris Descartes University, unsurprisingly, the researchers were kind of weird. After all, any university with the name Descartes in it must think and therefore is. The uh, statistical mechanics they used to model the neurons in the brain were derived from people who had epilepsy, which is an unusual way to approach this, but it kind of makes sense once you get into the details of it. What they were looking at is that if you have all these neurons, how do they synchronize with each other, and so how do they communicate, what happens when the cells are linked, and so on. So we start with the data sets they had. First, you have the uh, patterns of an individual when they're awake and theoretically likely to experience epilepsy, and then you have patterns from when someone is asleep, and therefore they aren't necessarily conscious. By comparing the uh, brains of the individuals when they were in a normal conscious state, a epileptic but otherwise conscious state, and an unconscious state when they were sleeping, they began to get some ideas about what's going on in the strange relationship with entropy. The uh, highest state of entropy was actually when the individual was awake and conscious under normal conditions. Yeah, humanity is most chaotic when we are awake and doing things. Actually, that's not so surprising. Naturally, of course, uh, being an incredibly tiny study with only a handful of individuals, you really can't rely on this as anything more than a a bizarre but curious study that, well, has at least made you question who and what you are. Shifting from questioning who you are to making more of yourself, we have a bionic hand that has turned a Swedish woman into a cyborg of sorts. The 50 year old Swedish woman lost her hand in an accident quite some time ago, and so she has now been given a prosthesis. This prosthesis is new in many ways, and partly because it has combined with her bones, muscles, and nerves to function. Yeah. As said, a cyborg. What makes this 
uh, prostheses unique and certainly for its time unique is that it takes signals from the neurons in the brain and it's able to uh, translate them and make the hand do what the individual wants. Importantly, unlike other implants and prostheses, this doesn't require external power as such, and so you don't need to have replacement batteries like with, say, the neural link, nor do you necessarily need to replace parts. All of it is run on what's going on from the individual. The muscles are used to control it, and because the muscles are used to control it, you no longer need to have, say, actuators in place because you don't need to have sensors because your brain is telling it what to do. You don't need cabling except to be able to move certain parts. All of this allows for much greater functionality. In order for this to be even remotely possible, it began with having two implants put in. These went into the bone, and they were basically anchor points. They allowed for the prostheses and everything else to be attached quite firmly to the, uh, let's call it... Uh, stump. Then they grafted muscles. Now, the muscle grafts were needed because they contain the electrodes that would be used to interact and interface with the prostheses. The improvements to this uh, beyond the uh, simple fact that there is a, a greater degree of dexterity is that the prosthesis itself doesn't rely on a cup or socket over the stump. Rather, it is using those uh, fixtures that went into the bone and thereby preventing the uh, a need, let's say, for such an uncomfortable fitting. Going on to uh, less optimistic news, we have immunoglobulin food sensitivity tests and the fact that uh, surprisingly, or well, unsurprisingly, they're not really valid. Yeah. First of all, food sensitivity is really not a thing. You're either allergic to it or you're not. Now you may be mildly allergic to it, and that could be described as food sensitivity, but it's still a bullshit term, and it's particularly used by those who practice integrative medicine. And of course anything that has a word before medicine isn't actually a medicine practice, because medicine is just medicine. This is why the alternative treatments that often prescribe food sensitivity or diagnose, and that term is used very loosely, food sensitivity, rely on something like an immunoglobulin test. Now, this is fundamentally just seeing if there is a antibody in the blood to a given thing. The stimulant would be, say, gluten or something else that causes the antibody to bind to it. Which is all well and good, you can use this, but they need to be very, very narrowly tailored antibodies to bind only to one thing. And this is what they use in something like an ELISA assay. For integrative or alternative medicine, it's just a really good way to scam people. The first reason for this is surprisingly simple. IgG is not involved in allergic response to anything. You need to look for IgE for that. IgE is what is released from the appropriate cells, mast cells one that comes to mind, but that's what you're after, not IgG. And so, if you have IgG responding to something, that's not actually an allergic response, that is something else entirely. We should clarify slightly. Food intolerances do exist, but intolerance in this case is that the body isn't able to digest them. And that's a completely separate issue to what is generally conflated between intolerance and allergies. Intolerances are generally attributed to the same sort of category as an allergy when it comes to these sorts of scams. For instance, somebody may have digestive issues in terms of, say, lactose, and that's because their body doesn't have the necessary enzyme to break it down. It can't digest it. Because of this, it does cause some concerns there but that is nowhere near the same issue as what happens with an allergic reaction. This is why sensitivity should not be put in the same category as an intolerance, and even intolerance is, well, considerably more complicated and simple in some ways than an allergy is. Further to the rather obvious issue of looking at the wrong antibodies, those who are trying to claim that there is some sort of intolerance or a similar sensitivity are trying to argue that the immune system is responding to the stimulus 
days and possibly weeks later, although most of the time it's generally put down as hours to days. The issue here is that that's not how this works. In nearly all instances, any kind of response is going to come at most within hours, maybe as much as 12 hours, but that is at the extreme end. You're not going to see a response from the immune system days later. It simply doesn't happen. You get exposed to the stimulant, and then you react. That's how the immune system operates. It doesn't sit there and go, I won't deal with this now, I'll come back later on. And this is why looking for IgG antibodies is not going to work. They generally get produced later on. Although you may see that there is an increase in IgG in the body after consuming something, you also see the same increase in those who have no symptoms and no sensitivity as such. Therefore, there is no relationship between consuming what could cause a reaction and those who have no reaction whatsoever. In terms of uh, food that would actually make you react, we have the world's newest hotless pepper. Yeah, somebody has decided to spend their time and effort making an even hotter chili pepper, and the Guinness World Records has now recognised it. The same guy who made the Carolina Reaper has also made the Pepper X. This is a, uh, a kind of horrifying chili, let's say. Curry has spent the last 10 years building on the Carolina Reaper to make the Pepper X. The Pepper X has 2.69 million Scoville units. These are the units used to measure the heat of something like this. The Habanero has 100,000. Yeah, this thing is nearly 270 times more spicy. By no means is it as spicy as some of the comments that occur on the internet, but it is still very hot. The improvement in terms of uh, Scoville heat units is not insignificant. Uh, the Carolina Reaper has a bit over 1.641 million Scoville units. The uh, Pepper X has uh, coming on 1 million more units at 2.693 million Scoville heat units. Uh, considering that, it's no wonder that uh, Carrie was still feeling the burn three and a half hours after consuming just one of the peppers. The uh, way this was made was by crossbreeding the Carolina Reaper with a, a mystery and unknown pepper sent by a, an acquaintance of Mr. Curry. In the terms of things that are being crossbred and otherwise developing new possible crops, we have China claiming that they have a, a new variety of rice that is uh, incredibly tolerant, if not will thrive well enough, in saline conditions, a saline being something that's heavy in salt. In this case, they're particularly looking to grow it in Xinjiang, that area of China that is currently undergoing a genocide with the Uyghurs. Importantly, the ability to be able to grow rice in that area is a massive boon to China. Not because they are going to have plenty of free land if they keep going the way they are, but because their southern areas that are well, you could describe them as the Chinese version of the Grain Belt, are currently undergoing big problems with flooding, storms, earthquakes, and more. Effectively, the various natural disasters that would tell you the end of the world is coming. And as a result, all of their farming in that area has gone to shit. There's no food that can be harvested because they're being flooded. Nothing is growing because the area is going through droughts, and therefore there's no water for it. If they can grow something, they can't harvest it because the roads are destroyed from landslides and earthquakes. If that doesn't happen, then the food that is harvested begins to rot in storage. They need somewhere else to grow food, and Xinjiang would be ideal, but for the fact that the land is all salinated, or therefore unsuitable for just about every single crop. You can't grow plants in salty soil. You can, however, grow plenty of things in salty comments. Where this gets particularly useful is not just that they're able to grow rice in an area where it shouldn't otherwise grow. It takes up that salt, and it does store it. This means that if China's reporting is accurate, and that is a, a big if, the soil will be increasingly tolerant for a new species to be planted in that area. So they could go from saline tolerant rice to something like cotton, which could then not be sold due to the forced labour issues, but then they could grow something like corn, if they were trying to actually provide food and not just go for clout.
the underlying uh, basis for this is the predictable things, though. That is, they've had to genetically modify the rice in order for this to work. Whilst it's not the same sort of modifications as for golden rice, it is still a genetic modification, and they've done so to try and get at least decent results. Now, because China uses bizarre measurements, they've given us data that makes it really hard to figure out what the hell is going on. First, they tell us that it's somewhere around 573.8 kilograms per mu. Now, this is a area equal to 15 hectares, or 37 acres. That means you're getting somewhere around... If this reporting is accurate, that would only be something like 15 kilograms per acre, which doesn't seem quite right. So it's more than likely the publication has the numbers backwards, otherwise this makes no sense. If it is indeed backwards, then you would be getting somewhere closer to 3.5 tons per an acre, although again, this is theoretically accurate, not necessarily accurate. Based on that, however, the issues from this are going to be uh, pretty much obvious. Xinjiang is, at least ideally, a area where you could grow things, but as shown with the issues of growing cotton in Xinjiang, a rice probably wouldn't be much better. And that's for a very simple reason. It needs water. It needs lots of water. Xinjiang also is mostly made up of a desert, so they're going to need water, and they're going to need water that is at least able to support the life of the rice. Rice needing lots of water, they really only have the option of saline rich water from places that otherwise it can't be used. And this means that while yeah, they can get their first crop of rice, it's all well and good, they can't grow much else for now. Shifting back to physics, but now looking at uh, a concept called pseudogravity. That is, scientists used a crystal to be able to bend light and thereby recreate something similar to the idea of gravity, but also not. It has in some ways been compared to a black hole in the way that it can distort light. Understand that the researchers aren't actually creating any kind of gravity, it's that the effect, let's say, is similar to what we see with gravity. That is, it can cause light to change its movement. This is done using uh, photonic crystals. Photonic crystals is just a very fancy way of saying very highly ordered and repetitive crystal structures, which, because of this, have a refractive index that shifts reliably. You don't have to worry about there being uh, bizarre inclusions or other unexpected changes you will know exactly what's happening when, where, and how. Using uh, this particular kind of crystal, they're able to shine a light into an enclosure. The enclosure is necessary because otherwise you would have other light getting in the way and causing all kinds of issues. Once the uh, light hits this photonic crystal, it begins to move, but it moves predictably. And that's the key here. They can reliably and predictably move the light in a particular way. The final news we have for you this week is uh, similarly bizarre, but in some ways more so. It is a uh, strange kind of ice that will only melt at temperatures that are ridiculously hot. And whilst yes, this does sound like sci-fi and fantasy, it is real. Although we say that, uh, take what comes with considerable amounts of salt. Uh, let's start with what this thing is. It's called supionic ice, and the name is just as fanciful as the thing itself. Four years ago, it was confirmed to exist, and it was actually made. Making it was not an easy thing to do. It, it does occur naturally in very harsh environments. And by harsh environments, we're talking about the uh, water-rich locations on gas giants like Uranus and Neptune. This means incredible pressure, partly from gravity and partly from the sheer size, but to a certain degree, other issues as well. Uh, this means that what it is, is not ice that uh, anyone would be familiar with otherwise. Supionic ice exists largely because water is really weird. For most people, the solid state of matter for something is going to be when it is most dense and therefore, theoretically, most solid. For water, this isn't true. There is a point at which water is most dense, but it's not when it's frozen solid. 
is just a little bit above frozen solid at about 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. There is also a point at which water exists known as the triple point. And this triple point is where it's both as a gas, a liquid, and a solid. And these are just a few of the bizarre things that water does. This is part of what makes supionic ice not only bizarre, but gives it some of its properties. First of all, it is unusually conductive, and that does make it useful for, let's say, moving energy. And because it can more readily move energy, it doesn't melt itself, because it doesn't retain any of that energy and therefore doesn't get hot. To be clear about it, we are talking about some ridiculous temperatures here. To start with, temperatures up to 8,500 freedom units, 5,000 kelvins to use the scientific nomenclature, which is somewhere around 4,700 degrees Celsius if you're using civilized numbers. The uh, lasers also caused the pressure in the environment to get to somewhere around 2 million atmospheres. This has uh, implications, let's say, uh, not necessarily for the superionic ice itself on Earth, uh, because that's an analog or artificially made synthesized version of it, or rather it has uh, not insignificant implications uh, for some of the planets in our solar system. If you think about the gas giants like Neptune, Uranus, and even Jupiter possibly, you have massive pressure pushing down on these masses of water on the planet. And because you have massive pressure, you now have the formation of this superionic ice. That means that there's going to be multiple layers of what is arguably solids, just not solids that we're familiar with. It is something that under normal atmospheric conditions would in fact be a liquid. But under these atmospheric pressure conditions, it has been forced into a solid. In a way, you can think of it as one of the pressure pots used for resin, as the container is vacuumed. You draw out all the air, and because the air pockets within the resin are drawn out, they also come out of the resin and you have a firm solid resin. This is similar, but it's the opposite idea. Instead of drawing all the air out, you increase the pressure inside the pot, and you push everything down, squishing it hard until it is flat. And not just do the implications apply to the uh, nature and structure of the planet, but it could also explain some of the bizarre readings of vehicles from NASA that have flown by, notably Voyager 2, that identified unusual magnetic pole activity from the planets in question. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.